Today is the feast of St. Gregory Nazianzen, bishop and doctor of the church. Epistle from the book of Ecclesiasticus. The just will give his heart to the resort early to the Lord that made him, and he will pray in the sight of the Most High. He will open his mouth in prayer and will make supplication for his sins. For if it shall please the great Lord, he will fi fill him with the spirit of understanding, and he will pour forth the words of his wisdom as showers. And in his prayer, he will confess to the Lord, and he will direct his counsel and his knowledge, and in his secrets shall he meditate. He shall for show forth the discipline he hath learned, and shall glory in the law of the covenant of the Lord. Many shall praise his wisdom, and it shall never be forgotten. The memory of him shall not depart away, and his name shall be in request from generation to generation. Nations shall declare his wisdom, and the church shall show forth his praise. The continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt lose its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is good for nothing any more but to be cast out and to be trodden on by men. You are the light of the world. A city seated on a mountain cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but upon a candlestick, that it may shine it to all that are in the house. So let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For a man I say to you, for a man I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall not pass of the law, till all be fulfilled. He therefore that shall break one of these least, least commandments, and shall so teach men, shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But he that shall do and teach, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Please be seated. And in Father and the Son and Holy Ghost, amen. <clears throat> we begin with this for heavenly assistance. For the sermon, Abraia gracia plena da mistecum, benedicta tu rebus, em rectus fructus vantes tu Jesus. Today's saint, Saint Gregory of Nazianzen, lived in a period of the church where yet to fight for the faith. As bishop, he had to fight many heresies to keep the faith pure. We live in a similar situation in this great crisis of the church, this great apostasy in the last 50, 60 years since Vatican II. In fact, since the great scandal last fall on the Amazon Synod and last few weeks with the church, Catholic churches being closed, some may wonder, what has happened to the Catholic Church? So we'll try to answer this question today in a general way. As a couple of Catholic writers have said, for many centuries, men have attempted to destroy the Catholic Church. Various means have been employed. Persecution only caused the Church to grow. Infiltration was an alternative plan. It would take years decades, even centuries, but it would also be extremely effective. If you cannot overtake the fort from without, send a spy within who will open the gates for your enemies. An ingenious plan was devised. Men and women whose sole aim or purpose was to destroy the Catholic Church found their way into Catholic seminaries and convents. Years later, these ambitious men and women achieved positions of prominence and power. 
And when the ground was ready, they helped colleagues who likewise disguised their real intentions and ideas to climb the ladder to the top. Priests be become bishops, bishops become cardinals, cardinals can help elect one of their own number as a pope. Heads of the edu educational departments can hold great sway over multitudes of people. They can fashion the coming generations and the future priests. Following the death of Pope Pius XII, which took place in 1958, a coalition of modernists, Freemasons, and Marxists, communists took over the Vatican. They achieved positions of prominence and could come out of the woodwork since their great enemy, Pope Pius XII, was out of the way. They put their men into key positions, and these men presided over and controlled the ecumenical and liturgical commissions and imposed many of the edicts and directives emanating from Vatican II. Holy Scripture tells us of a great falling away and a, and a universal apostasy from God. And we actually witness, witness these events today. God permitted these events as a just chastisement for the laxity of many Catholics prior to Vatican II. Many Catholics obviously did not appreciate their faith at that time. Otherwise, the work of the modernist reformers could never have achieved such widespread acceptance, nor have been carried out so smoothly. The bishops also bowed their heads and went along with the crowd. Through the course of time, many of the older bishops who objected to the changes of Vatican II eventually died. They were probably replaced by men who could continue the work of Vatican II. Even though many bishops today work as free agents, yet they are working for the same goals as the modernists. Now some of us may say this sounds as though the, this, that there's a conspiracy. Not only is there a conspiracy, but they know that there, there was a conspiracy. An important image will was behind it all. His name is Satan. The Catholic Church has been the devil's public enemy, number one, for centuries. The Church has been responsible for leading countless multitudes down the straight and narrow path to heaven. If the devil could conquer the Catholic Church, he would have accomplished his greatest goal. This will never happen since the Catholic Church will last until the end of time. Yet he could mint a counterfeit church and name it the Catholic Church. He could craftily control the Vatican, control the church buildings and institutions. He could put his people in positions of prominence. And he could deceive multitudes. Remember, he has had almost 2,000 years to plan this. And Holy Scripture foretold these events. It is not important in God's eyes that we have the approbation of the world and follow the crowd. Remember, only eight individuals remained faithful to God when the great flood came upon the earth in punishment for the sins of men. Another example, after Solomon's death, ten tribes of Israel rejected God, and only the tribes of Judah and Benjamin remained faithful. The separate tribes from which was formed the kingdom of Israel were by far more numerous than the two that remained faithful. And this did not matter. As with heresy, so with them, in a few years they were entirely, be, they, they entirely disappeared from history, leaving but a name behind them. And to the two tribes God showed mercy, for from them came the Savior of the world. So shall it be with the Catholic Church. She has seen the rise and fall of all forms of heresies, many of which for a time seemed to threaten her existence. But they have passed away while she remains, as she will remain to the end. 
Let's recall a bit, a bit of ch church history. The subtle Arian heresy swept across the world in the fourth century and caused a vast number of Catholics to deny the divinity of Christ. Some historians claim that 80 to 90 percent of Western civilization at the time embraced Arianism. The rulers of the various provinces embraced it since it was a compromise between paganism and Christianity. The well-to-do, common folk, and Roman soldiers adopted it because it was the popular religion of the time. Many bishops followed the erroneous teaching of Arius and spread it to their flocks. One man, however, St. Athanasius, had the courage to oppose Arius. And he was instrumental in having the Arian heresy condemned during the Council of Nicaea in the year of our Lord, 325. Of course, he was persecuted for his beliefs and was exiled on five different occasions. As one author summarized, the Arian heresy which reduced the second person of the Blessed Trinity to the status of demigod would ultimately have destroyed not only the Trinity, but also the Incarnation and the Redemption. Take away the God-man, and all that lies between Bethlehem and Calvary becomes meaningless. The teaching of the Church is a house of stone, where one floor rests upon another. Remove one, and the whole house will tumble down. Athanasius held the fortress of orthodoxy almost unaided against the world. He held it against heretical bishops, priests, and laymen, and even against the powerful emperor Constantine. The heretics would again be condemned, but they would now resist expulsion and backed by the Christian emperor, more concerned to avoid riots than to preserve the purity of faith, they would continue to maintain their places and their offices in the church. They would even for a moment hold almost all the key positions. And a day would come on which St. Jerome would say, quote, the whole world groaned to find itself Arian. St. Athanasius indeed was one of the greatest men of that era. His valiant perseverance won the world back for Christ. And through the course of time, there were other rebellions against the Catholic Church. The Eastern Orthodox Churches in Western Europe and Asia broke their ties from Rome in the 11th century. Martin Luther revolted against the Church in the 16th century. And following his death, German princes took advantage of the chaos created by Luther. They expanded the reforms of Luther into a full-fledged reformation. These princes saw this opportunity in using this political device to confiscate church property in order to strengthen their own political positions in the Germanic lands. Half of Europe drank in the poison of the new doctrine, which was to lead first to denial of religious authority as regards the supernatural order, and next to denial of religion itself, followed by its banishment from the social and finally from every sphere of human endeavor. England followed Henry VIII out of the church in the 16th century. In these countries, priests, bishops, and patriarchs led astray the faithful who continue to attend their local churches. It has happened before. It is possible that it will happen again. Do we not witness this today? Is it the same church? The six popes preceding Vatican II condemned ecumenism, religious liberty, changes in the liturgy, liturgy modernism, the evolution of dogma, and the concept, concept of pluralism. The decrees of Vatican II, as well as those still emanating from the Vatican today, from the, from the six last popes, act actively promote all of the above. 
they both cannot be right. The Pope since Vatican II have taught the grand heresy that the Catholic Church is no longer the one true Church. Dialogue with all religions, who are also called the people of God, is officially promoted by their encyclical letters, papal pronouncements, and public actions. Worship with non-Catholics and non-Christians is not merely encouraged, but officially decreed. These men have not merely introduced small changes, but they have actually plotted a new course for the church, a new direction. Our Lord Jesus Christ never engaged in dialogue with false religions or joined in pagan worship. Christ never comp compromised on matters of faith. He opposed error and evil and taught the true way to God. Christ had compassion on the multitude, but he condemned the Pharisees for their hypocrisy and lack of true leader leadership. The popes, the saints, the fathers, and the doctors of the church have consistently taught the Catholic faith one way for 2,000 years. And on the other hand, Vatican II for the past 50 years have taught it another way. One may ask, how could this happen? How could this be a new church? I'm still attending St. Mary's Church, and Father Murphy is still a pastor, and the school buildings are still there. Let's analyze the situation. It is still the same church building, but radically different things are going on inside. It is not only a new mass, but a counterfeit mass. The teachings emanating from the pulpits are not found in Christ's gospel. The new sacraments are not the same ones that Christ instituted. These are not two different aspects of the Catholic Church, but rather two distinctly different churches. Even the church calendar has changed. The two are known and described by their differences, not by their similarities. Imagine, for example, what would happen if all the school teachers throughout the world had a meeting and decided that everything would have to change. The people would have to be re-educated. All the things that were taught in mathematics, social studies, science, and language were wrong and would have to be changed. It would be unlawful to add, subtract, speak, or to write the old way. Thousands of years of scientific research, heritage, history, and language would be tossed out. What would be the reaction? People would not tolerate such nonsense. Yet this is exactly what Vatican II has, II has done in the religious sphere. Is a new church instituted by God or by man? St. Thomas Aquinas said, the moon draws her light from the sun, and the church is beautiful like the moon because she takes her light from Christ, her spouse, and shines with his grace. St. Hilary, a doctor of the church, called the Catholic Church, quote, the mouth of Christ because it is to it and through it that the mysteries are revealed. The same cannot be said of the new church. It is not based on, the, on Christ, but on the fickle whims of deceitful men. The Catholic Church is not merely going through a bad time. We are witnesses to a revolution whose ultimate objective is the destruction of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass and the Catholic Church. That which it calls itself the Catholic Church today, that is the new church, is not the Catholic Church. So Paul tells us in the epistle to Galatians, though we apostles, or even an angel from heaven, were to come and preach to you a different gospel from what we have preached, let him, let him be anathema. No man has a right to establish a religion. No man has a right to di dictate to his fellow man what he shall do to save his soul. Religion must come from God, 
And any religion that is not established by God is a false religion, a human institution, and not an institution of God. St. Thomas More, who was Chancellor of England under King Henry VIII, chose to die rather than deny or compromise his Catholic faith. Thomas resigned being Chancellor of England when he learned from the Duke of Norfolk that the bishops of England submitted to Henry's divorce and the establishment of the Church of England. St. John Fisher was the only bishop in the whole country that opposed Henry's action. He was in prison and executed for his faith and is now a canonized saint. We can hide our heads in the sand and pretend that everything is all right. Or we can pray to God and help for help in these trying times, live our Catholic faith and research and study the situation for ourselves. Catholics must, up, up today must eventually make a choice of either following what the Catholic Church and 260 popes have taught for the past 20 centuries or what Vatican II and the last six popes have taught for the last 50 years. Since they are complete opposites, both cannot be right. The practice of walking the fence cannot go on indefinitely. How do we know that the new church is not from God? Remember, God is supreme. God is eternal and unchangeable. He always was, always will be, and always remains the same. God is immuni immutable. So are his laws and his church. Where does anyone get the right and the authority to change the, the unchangeable? Who commissioned the modernist ethologians of Vatican II to rewrite his, his Bible? Rethink his gospel and redo the Ten Commandments in order to fit the modern, modern lifestyle. Who gave them the right to destroy the sacred worship of God, which was handed down from Christ and the apostles, replacing it with a man-made creed? Why is it that the vast majority of today's Catholics remain compliant and watch the very heart of the church being ripped out? The tragedy of the situation is that the modernist leaders have draped themselves with the trappings of the church, that is, wolves in sheep's clothing, in order to lead the laity to their modernist goals. Is it that today's Catholic is being denied the guidance of the teaching of the true church in order to keep him compliant? The new church always allows almost anything today, anything but the traditional observance of Catholicism. There is such great emphasis on dialogue, and where is the dialogue with those who wish to remain Catholic? Where is the dialogue with those who wish to remain faithful to the teachings of Christ and the Church has taught and handed down through the centuries? Our beloved Roman Catholic Church has been the victim of insidious subversion and infiltration. The vast majority have gone along with the internal destruction of the Church by the clergy. They tell us that we must be obedient and go along. Are we to obey the priests, the theologians, the bishops, the cardinals, the popes of the new church, who are teaching condoning heresy? Remember, there's a difference between true and false obedience. God is the ultimate authority Legitimate authority takes God's place on earth to ensure order in society. If men go contrary to God's law and command others to follow their example, they must not be obeyed. Suppose that you inherited a spacious mansion that is many centuries old. Then someone deceitfully claiming to be a distant relative illegally obtained the possession of it in order that it be utterly destroyed and ray and burned down, the furnishings sold, and that you are commissioned to help with the work. Not only is the original edifice to be leveled, but the another dwelling is to be built on the site, retaining the name of the former, former dwelling. Would it be authentic? Would you join in the demolition work? 
We see the perversion of the souls of children in Catholic schools with new corrupt catechisms and sex education. We see the priests and nuns causing the destruction of the souls of the, of, the, of the adolescents, the young people, by fostering the new morality which teaches that anything goes. How many clergy and laity have rationalized, rationalized and made excuses for the obvious heresies and flaws of Vatican II? Every time another abomination came out, how many bowed their heads and obeyed? They obeyed heresy, sacrilege, and compromise. Day after day, week after week, year after year. They obeyed church authority while their conscience told them it was wrong. And some of these are priests who say the Latin Mass, but are forced by the bishop to accept the new ways and not rock the boat. If parents told their children to steal or break one of God's laws, would, would they be bound to obey them? Of course not. If the priests and bishops are preaching a different message than the one which Christ left, should we follow after them? Again, the answer is, of course not. How would Jesus Christ look upon parish priests who have let their flocks slake their thirst at the contaminated springs of heretical catechisms, false doctrines, and perverted, perverted liturgy, and remain silent at the pulpit about the heresies of Vatican II? How many priests allow their flock to be overtaken by the wolves, the devils, by not warning them of the danger they may be exposed to? And remember that any priest with so-called good standing with the bishop has permission to say the Latin Mass in his diocese, such as SSF, SSP, Institution of Christ the King, Indult Masses, and so on, they must make an agreement with the local bishop not to rock the boat, not to preach against the heresies of Vatican II. And they must give their money collections to the bishop, which supports such wickedness as pro-abortion groups. And the faithful call these Latin Mass priests heroes. They are not heroes, but traitors, cowards. Another look back in history of the church at Pope Honorius I. Are we aware of the case of Pope Honorius I back in the year of our Lord, 625 to 638? After his death, he was excommunicated and condemned, and his remains were scattered to the winds. Pope Honor Honor Honorius I was condemned not because he solemnly taught heresy, but because he failed to stamp out heresy during his reign as Pope. He was infallible, and he did not publicly teach heresy to the Church. Nevertheless, he was excommunicated for not condemning it. And this will certainly happen again in the future with the last six modernist popes, when finally the time of the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary occurs in the world. Here's an appropriate quotation from Pope Pius XII on May 13, 1946, which describes, summarizes this tragedy. He said, in the decisive hour of history, in which the kingdom of evil with infernal strategy uses every means, and loses all its forces to destroy faith and morals and the kingdom of God, the children of light and the children of God must use every means to pledge themselves totally to defend these, if they wish to avoid more disastrous and vastly greater ruin than the material ruin heaped up by the war. In this struggle, no one can be neutral or hesitant. We need an enlightened, a convinced, and fearless Catholicism, one that takes its inspiration from faith and is obedient to the commandments, a Catholicism of mind and action, both in public and in private." End of quote. In summary, the temptations of our Lord Jesus Christ are to us a subject both of consolation and instruction. Let us then live in strong hope and strong faith in these times, 
The triumph of the Immaculate Heart will occur, as she said at, at Fatima, Portugal, Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen.